and welcome to Furious Driving. And today we're at the wheel of Nissan's early 90s offering in the family car and fiercely fought Retmobile arena. This is the first generation P10 Nissan Primera, which ran from 1990 until 1996, and notably was built in Washington Tyne and Weir here in the UK. You barely see a survivor of these cars ever anymore. So we're lucky to be in this amazing low mileage, perfect survivor. The question is, was it as good as its perhaps better known rivals, things from Ford, Vauxhall and the like? Well, there's only one way to find out. Let's get on the road, take a look around and find out. Now, quick word from our sponsors and on with the review. Furious Driving, proud to be supported by Diamond Bright, protecting, cleaning and caring for the Furious fleet and for yours with 10% off using code FD10. Bidding Classics, the online classic car marketplace with more cars added every week. And Lancaster Insurance cover the Furious fleet. They are one of the biggest specialist insurers in the UK covering all areas of vintage to modern classic cars and motorbikes. Follow the links in the description below. Welcome to Furious Driving and this is a 1990 P10 Nissan Primera 2 litre GS. The second big family car built here in the UK by Nissan at their Washington Tyne and Weir factory where they were churning out some of the best built product in Europe in the 1990s. Now a quick jaunt down memory lane. The Bluebird had appeared in 1986 and this was the first car built by Nissan here in Britain. Four years later it was definitely time for change. The Bluebird was a great car and they built it impeccably. However, it was JDM through and through. The lights, which are kind of knobbly and sticky out to the big angles and everything, it was pure Japanese design. However, the big Japanese makers were at that point desperately trying to convert their product and their image to look and feel more European. All the makers were doing it. Perhaps the most successful of all was the Lexus LS400, which is basically a very good Mercedes with the wrong badge on it. Nissan though did a bang up job with this, their entry into the Retmobile marketplace because they had a huge fight on their hands because in the early 1990s, the Retmobile family car fight was as strong as it ever was. It was in a golden era for brilliant family cars. The Sierra and the Sapphire had just been refreshed and they were looking and driving really rather well indeed. Rear wheel drive, great engines, nice trim, well made. You've got the Cavalier Mark III, which is perhaps one of the best built, most reliable and well, fantastic handling Vauxhalls ever. The last comfortable Vauxhall, as I've said more than once. Then you've got the Peugeot 405, which is out and out one of the best, most refined handling family cars in history. And that's before you get to things like the Rover 200 and 400. The R8 had been released in 1989. Again, another benchmark of brilliantness. There were so many great cars in this era. And so jumping into this marketplace, they had to find something really quite special. So the Primera was designed with the European market in mind and very heavily leaning on European influence. The question was, could they build a car that handled as well as this 405, was as well built as a Mark III Cavalier, and was well received as a Sierra? Well, I think we'll find a couple of those they definitely got right. But believe it or not, despite being very, very European in terms of influence, it was designed by a gentleman called Mamoru Aoki, who I suspect is Japanese. Likewise, the man who did the underpinnings, the suspension work on this car, another bit of a genius, that was Kazutoshi Mizuno, who, if you're into your Nissan Skylines and GTRs, you will recognize the name as the man who also did the suspension on the R35. So, someone who probably knew what they were talking about, which we'll come back to in a moment. But looking at the styling of this thing, it is a world away from the Bluebird it replaced. It is all 90s. The jelly mold smooth curves are peak 1990s aero. It is absolutely of that decade. Really couldn't be much more different from the cars it replaced, the Bluebird here in Britain and the Auster and Stanza over in Japan. And that's where we come to where the car was actually sold because this was a European designed car for Europe and for Japan. This is the exclusive markets virtually for this thing. And the name even means first or number one in Spanish. It was only sold across Europe and in Japan. In America, it didn't fit into their range lineup. They did, however, sell it as the base model luxury sedan in the Infinity range, not as a Nissan. Now around the front of the car, it is gorgeously smooth, round and curved. We've got integrated flush fitting headlights with this flush number plate. We've got a black rubbing strip here on the top of the bumper. The rest is body colored. And we've even got fog lights on this mid-range GS. You would not be embarrassing yourself in the company car car park here. Under the bonnet though, 
there was a choice of three engines at launch. At the bottom of the tree, there was a 1.6 carbureted engine, which was European only. So Japan didn't get that one, apart from in the Avenir panel van, which is a semi-related panel van based on an estate car. Then there was the 1.8, which was not available in left-hand drive. So that was UK and Japan only. That was fuel injected. And finally, there was this, the king of the engines, the two liter twin cam 16 valve with multi-point fuel injection, which everybody got and everybody wanted. And this one's got a leaf on it. Um, this makes 115 horsepower and 166 newton meters of torque. And that means this car will do about 124 miles an hour, which is you know, quite respectable, frankly. It's a family car. You shouldn't be doing more than 70, as people who are very boring will say all the time. Heading around the back of the car, there was two main body styles. There was this, the four-door saloon. Then, of course, there was the five-door hatch, which looked very similar indeed, but had a slightly more practical hatchback. Thirdly, there was an estate version, although that was technically not actually a Primera, even though it was badged as the Primera Traveller. That was a Japanese market Avenir estate, which was not actually the same car. It's a very similar car, but not quite the same, which was a full five-door estate, which they sold as the Primera estate, but it wasn't. Anyway, lifting the boot, we will find, Ooh, interesting hinge action on there, which is quite entertaining. We've got a frankly enormous boot in here. And we do find that this car is an award winner because this car, this 1991 Primera, was at the Festival of the Unexceptional. Uh, last year, in fact, not in 1991. There wasn't a Festival of the Unexceptional in 1991. And not desperately surprisingly, it won. Rentmobile of the Year 2022. What's that? The 90s called, they want their phone back. <laughs> so yeah, you can see this is actually quite a nice car. I'm driving an award winner. Anyway, the boot, as I say, goes back a very long way. So you can put a fair amount of stuff in there, whatever your nefarious activity you'd like to partake in. There's room for it in here. It does have a hatch through to fold the back seats down. However, it's a very small aperture in the middle, so you're not gonna get much bigger than a child canoe through that. Oh, and check this out. Original P10 factory service or dealer service manual with every single thing you could ever hope to do to this car covered in this book. Right, let us climb aboard the P10 and see what it's like inside. And wow, first of all, I'm being struck by the amount of velour. Velour everywhere. Velour seats, velour door cards. Wow, this thing is super lovely. The quality you can immediately feel is just incredible. They were doing very well to match the Mark III Cavalier in terms of the feel of solidity of absolutely everything. The door grabs, the bits of plastic that you touch are all really, really high quality. So we've got this lovely velour in the door. We've got a slightly padded armrest here in the center. We have got elephant hide plastic everywhere else, but no creaks, no rattles, and it's all a slightly soft touch. There's a bit of noise and vibration reduction from that big door speaker down there. And we've even got a carpeted door pocket. So again, it hides the rattles, hides the vibrations, makes the thing feel so much more solid. Stepping inside the car, before we even get into it, we've got very Japanese in its uh, origin. We've got the pull push lever for the boot and the fuel cap down here beside the thing. And you can see the level of adjustment we've got on the driver's seat as well. So anyone can get comfortable in these lovely buckety velour, oh, that velour. In fact, it's like Tweedy, it's Twelor. Another Twelor car. We'd love a bit of Twelor. Climbing inside out the sun. It is not the most inspiring visually in terms of dashboards. However, everything you want on a basic level is here. We've got a big curved T-shelf area here. We don't want to be putting anything on that. That will be a disaster. On the left-hand side, the passenger is not treated to an airbag um, because let's face it, who wants safety? But we do have a big place. We can put sandwiches and biscuits. Sandwiches on the left, smaller area for biscuits, maybe even a Belgian bun or some kind of cinnamon whirl on the right-hand side. That'll fit just lovely in there. And you can see we're coming into the future because we're in the 1990s. We've got pretty intense ventilation, so we're not gonna have troubles with the car misting up too badly. Little vent to demist the side windows just there. Big vent for the windscreen just there. We've got our passenger vents just here as well. So lots of ventilation. You'll even see we have got the original Slater's car dealer tax disc holder in the windscreen. You might have seen we've also got the number plates and we've got the dealer sticker in the back of the car. This is an astonishingly original vehicle. It's actually only got 41,000 miles on it. It's cool. I'm closing in on 42 now. The car's just driven quite a long way to get here today. So anyway, moving back into the centre, it does feel very modern. The previous car, the Bluebird, it was very blocky, very solid. 
it looked great at the time when it came out. However, as time moved on, this curved, more integrated, more flowing design language was becoming a thing, and so the cars had to evolve to accommodate it. We've got the solid elephant's hide dash, which is, it is incredibly solid. It feels so, so good. That houses a black plastic dashboard area just here, which has got the twin vents in the center, which you can turn off and on. Alarm warning light, you may have noticed the protected by Gemini stickers around the car. Rear fogs, hazard, big switches here, big, big switches. Rear screen heater. And we've got the original Blaupunk radio. Oh, that is so cool. It's a radio cassette, um, which has got six. God, I thought my eyes were going funny then, but it's actually got a slight wobble on that. <laughs> I thought I was having a stroke. Yeah, auto reverse, stereo, six presets. And we've even got a dashboard full of audio tape that came from the previous owner. Yellow submarine. Oh, Beach Boy is excellent. Shadows, 20 golden greats. What else we got? Ugh. It's Beach Boys again. History of pop. These all came from the previous owner of the car. They left them with the vehicle, which is really cool. Anyway, underneath the radio cassette, we've got divided, you'll notice, by these big solid slats, which give visual delineation between the areas of the dashboard, but also add strength to the structure. So again, no rattles. We've got our heating and ventilation. No aircon, of course, being 1991. The very, very top ones did have that as an option, but down here in the mere GS range, you weren't gonna be troubled by that. This particular bit of the dashboard is something of a hangover to previously styled designs of, of Japanese cars. This does feel very mid 80s, in fact. Underneath that, we've got more cassette storage. Oh yes, wow, that's violent. Video camera sound effects, that's a party and a half. This one is Double Hit Parade. Various artists, never ending song of love. Whee, that is just gonna take your hand off if you're not careful. Alan Freeman's History of Pop. Is that Fluff Freeman? And finally, oh, there's just the shadows again. So yeah, that's awesome cassette storage. And underneath that, we move into the, that's a, quite a contrast for the, for the ashtray to just leisurely stroll out whilst the cassettes are gonna just lose you a finger. You've got yourself a cigarette on the go, and I don't smoke, so I don't know how urgent it must be, but I can imagine the ash and the burning stuff is about to fall off and set fire to the car, and this is wandering out leisurely at its own pace. You think you might change your tape in a minute. That takes your finger off. Then you've got your lighter, your 12 volt socket there, a little cubby hole, which is pretty much useless, anything apart from four polos, and a couple of blanking slots, which I guess might have been heated seats, perhaps, in that position. Then behind that, we have got travesty of all travesties, an automatic gearbox, four speed with overdrive, switch just there, on, off. There was a five speed manual available, which I understand is a sweet little unit, really, really nice. Behind that, we've got our handbrake, and we've got three electric window switches for the rest of the car. It's got four electric windows in here. Then we've got the lockout for the rest of the back seats. We've got a central locking. No switch just here for the driver's window because that is over here on the door. Like a fighter pilot getting ready to shoot his shot. You can take aim and you can drop the window. It's even one touch down on that thing as well. Now back to the main instrument binnacle. Well, this is quite a well-loaded binnacle because in the era of rep and bill one-upmanship, you needed to be selling the car with the toys that came with it. So in the, uh, the company car hierarchy, when your colleagues came and looked at your new car, they were impressed or even better jealous of your new toy. So we've got the speedometer up to, well, 140 miles now. As I say, it's 124 and only, only 42,000 miles. This was a privately owned car. Didn't do a lot of miles, but was fastidiously looked after. We got our temperature and our fuel. We've got warning lights left and right, and we've got our rev counter. Our rev counter, how cool is this? Redlining 6,500 RPM, peak power comes at 6.6, 6. and we've got a digital clock here and there as well, which is very smart indeed. We even got a doors open warning light. Moving back, we've got our solid, chunky feeling. Oh, interesting, slightly ill sounding <laughs> lights and warning. We've got our stalks, which do feel, feel very solid. We've got variable intermittent wipe, which is cool. We've got a nice feeling three spoke steering wheel, which does have a bit of a sci fi adventure look to it. And we've got a horn. Oh, that's kind of a sad pop, actually. What's happened to you, car? Who hurt you? Anyway, <laughs> moving back into the car itself, up above we have got a sunroof in the order of things of the 1990s. It is a mechanical manual tilt slide. How cool is that? 
so we can crank that tilt it the other way we've got a tilt up there so we've got a bit of breeze coming through we've got our little lights that's quite an unusual arrangement these big plastic toggles i've actually got a broken rcam cd player with uh buttons exactly like that i wonder if i could uh, pinch them and uh chris would notice <laughs> we've got visors with a mirror we've got a decent sized back seat let's have a quick look in there all right climbing in the back protected by gemini again we've got very much the same deal with the doors we've got our big velour panel we've got a solid feeling elephant hide we've got very solid feeling door handles these big rock over style locks which were very much the thing with japanese cars back then and we've got electric windows here in the back which is super cool no door pockets no cup holders here in the back but we have got a carpeted area and check out these original nissan floor mats rubber floor mats see if your kids are getting in the back with muddy boots it's not going to spoil that lovely carpet we have got more of this delicious velour world climber board we've got an armrest in the middle folds down we've got three seat belts we've got reasonable headroom and we've got another interior light we've also got big speakers for premium sound right let's get on the road in the p10 i should before we get our going just show you this keyring which is the original nissan dealer keyring fire oh, straight up but then it is nissan isn't it right slide it into drive and away we cruise now we've already covered in the uh, walking around section how well made the car feels the quality of the plastics don't fit and finish it really is quite superb i'm driving down this road with a few potholes and manhole covers and things and the only rattles and things are from the luggage the car itself is squeak free after 32 years which is phenomenally good nothing is cracked the dashboard hasn't cracked the plastics are good nothing's discolored or faded it really is an superbly built car but then we've got the handling. The handling question is one which is more subjective in many cases. In this case though, I'm led to believe the car is fantastic and I'm about to throw it through some quite tight twisty corners with the full knowledge the designer of the R35 GTR had his hand on the underpinnings of this car. It has got double wishbones front and rear and it was the first car in nissan's lineup to be front wheel drive and receive the double wishbone multi-link suspension setup they'd used in other vehicles and i've got to say that just flowed through there beautifully it really does feel astonishingly tight so well composed and well balanced so yeah that is definitely a triumph it is said that if you flipped one of these over alongside a flipped over alpha 156 the floor pans and the suspension setup would look remarkably similar as we continue to drive down these country lanes i can tell you the ride does continue to feel amazing it feels so modern and so refined it's quite a firm ride much firmer than a lot of 90s cars i've driven but at the same time it's very compliant very supple it's not rolling too badly to the corners a lot like an alfa romeo in fact so yes it is a very nice car to be in over potentially quite long periods of time in fact this car doesn't actually live that far from the factory it came from and uh, the owner has driven it down to kent today in one hit and i'm now taking it out for a ride and the car feels fresh and the owner was also quite refreshed this is a perfect long distance cruiser it's a great car to black down a country lane in as well it really is quite remarkable now of course nissan were very aware of the market they were playing to and so they had to be aware that there was a family car market which is going to want an affordable car with not too many bells and whistles and just good reliability but also there was a company car market the Repmobile, which was a huge stake in the british car buying market because company cars were a massive perk in the 90s and so many jobs came with a company car as a perk and so the car had to be good enough to convince the fleet managers and convince the salesmen who wanted to drive them and so there is about half a dozen trim levels at launch starting from the l which was so painfully povo spec that the glass was an optional extra in the window through a good range of mid-range ones up to the two liter with all the toys and later on we got the gs like this and then the sri which was the uh 
the semi-hot hatch later on. Interestingly, in Japan, they only got the four-door saloon and the estate for the most part because there was one car which was an anomaly in Japan, and that was the UK GT, which was the five-door, the only five-door saloon hatchback they sold in Japan, and that was built here in Britain and shipped over to Japan as a unique model, a special edition. As you can see, the car was very well equipped. We've got electric windows all around, we've got central locking, a rev counter, you name it, we've got all the toys. In around 93, the car got a mild facelift and things like ABS became a thing you could have. A passenger airbag became a thing you could have. I'm kind of feeling the fact we haven't got air conditioning today, but uh, you know, it was the 90s. We just opened the sunroof and sweated back then. The Primera was first shown to the public in 1989 in the Tokyo and Frankfurt Motor Shows as a pair of concept cars. There's Project 901 and Project UVX, both of which hinted at what was about to come in a matter of months. And then the car was launched in February 1990 in Japan and then in September 1990 here in Europe. Now the automatic gearbox is pretty smooth actually, as, as four-speed autos from the 90s go, this is one of the better ones, it has to be said. It's got the overdrive as well, so you've got a, a top speed on there as well, a bit like on the Crown Victoria, four-speed plus overdrive. And the brakes are pretty decent as well. The engineers at Nissan really did a great job of just ticking every box and making sure everything was doing what it was meant to do and being as good as really it could be. So yeah, well done Nissan, you did well with the Primera. So this is my speed bump test route that I use to put a car suspension really through its paces. And even this feels composed. I've got to say this is one of the best handling and built cars I've come across. It really does fulfill the brief of a car which rides and drives as well as a 405, but feels as solid as a Mark III um, Cavalier. It really is very impressive. The only downside with this car is that perhaps they've gone too European and a little bit too non-controversial with the design, so it's not as exciting to look at as some of the others. And admittedly, the 90s, the great cars, peak car in many ways, weren't always the, the most exciting cars to look at. The jelly mold could be seen as a little bit samey in some respects. However, this one is perhaps a little less exciting on the eye. Gosh, MX-3. And that perhaps harmed it in terms of sales because it wasn't a huge seller as Nissan had hoped. They did shift a lot of units, but not in the same ballpark as the Ford and the Vauxhall, even the Peugeot, the Renault, the Rover. So yes, in answer to my initial question, was it as good as the rivals? 100% definitely yes. Better in some cases than some of the other cars it was up against, which is quite surprising. If you want to see this car in person, it will be at the Festival of the Unexpected on the 29th of July. I believe it's in the concourse again, so go and make a beeline and check it out. If you have enjoyed this video, please do hit like and subscribe and hit the bell notification for future videos. And join us again next time driving something completely different.